Hey, book lovers, want to hear a story? Welcome back to Storytime with M. This is a bonus episode from M's Books and Cats podcast, where I am sharing one of my older books, a chapter a week. Right now I am sharing my oldest book that is still available for purchase. It is called Do You Remember Ella? And this week we're on chapter four. Enjoy. True love cannot be denied. Hey, at least we tried. But you were untrue. Now it will happen to you. True love died, no good reason why. You're a hell of a guy. Not a bad fella. Will you admit it? Do you remember Ella? Brando approached me a few days later. The worst of the wild rage had passed. Most of the students were once again ignoring me. I preferred being nameless. I was afraid when I saw him walking toward me. I hadn't seen Brando since the night at the hockey rink and I relived the brutal scene over and over in my nightmares. He still looked angry. Brando had always been a sweet guy, but now his face was a mask of barely contained rage. He came up close to me. His breath was hot on my cheek. I know what you're doing. Stop it. I'm not the one who did it. You can't blame me. Please, no more letters. He raised his hand, and crumpled in his fist was a bright blue piece of paper. My hand shook as I took it from him. He turned and walked away quickly. Brando, wait. He didn't, and I didn't follow him. The letter was written in a hand that I knew well. I felt sick, and the world went away. The next thing I knew, I was sitting outside with Marcus. He had his arm around me, and he smiled when he saw I was awake. Here she is. How are you feeling? I don't know. Dizzy? He rubbed my back gently. Just take it slow. You'll be okay. I looked around frantically. The letter was no longer in my hand. I jumped up to look for it, and the world went sideways. Marcus grabbed me before I fell and pulled me close. Whoa. Take it easy, Sophie. Is this what you're looking for? He held up the letter, but pulled it away when I tried to take it from him. What is this? Were you the one who wrecked the dressing rooms? No. I don't know what's going on. People keep bringing me these letters. I think it's Ella, but I can't be sure. I haven't seen her since she left school. You think she's the one behind the pranks? Maybe. I don't know. It doesn't seem like something she would do, but she was always kind of unpredictable. Have you told anyone else about this? No. I think that's good. Keep it quiet. Maybe Ella will slip up and get caught. I nodded slowly. He handed me the letter with a smile, and we sat quietly in the snow until the bell rang. Mrs. Parker didn't come back after the riot at the student assembly. She was afraid of the students. I knew how she felt. Her replacement was a thin, nerdy young man. He had graduated from college the spring before. He was eager to mold young minds and had strict rules. We spent most of class silently studying our textbooks or listening to Mr. Perry drone on in his mechanical way. All of the classes were quiet and subdued now. I liked the silence. Byron still wasn't speaking to me. He had been acting nervous and strange lately, and I wasn't upset when he didn't come to class that day. I opened my book and waited for the second bell to ring. I was beginning to relax just a little when Jennifer slid into the seat beside me. Jennifer was a typical Cullen Academy girl. She was tan, athletic, and bursting with school spirit. I knew her vaguely from my public speaking class, and she had always been nice to me. She was one of those girls who was nice to everyone. The only person she had avoided was Ella. They were from the same town and had been best friends from the age of three. Our freshman year, they had roomed together for the first half of the year, but but they quickly grew apart. Jennifer had been instantly absorbed into the school and was accepted by the popular kids almost instantly. She was perky, devoted to the school, and most importantly, a member of several varsity sports teams. Ella had always been an outcast. Her transition to a private high school full of strangers had not been what she expected, and she began to resent Jennifer for being so easily accepted. 
It started right after Halloween when Jennifer began dating a guy named Quint. He was the handsomest guy in the sophomore class, and everyone was in love with him. Valeria had set her sights on him, and she didn't take the news of their relationship well. She immediately started some nasty rumors about Jennifer and Ella. They were cruel and obviously fake, but they spread like wildfire through the student body. Jennifer had weathered it well. No one believed Valeria. Quint was madly in love with her, and that was enough to convince most of the school that Valeria was just jealous. It didn't change their opinion of Ella. She should have been cleared of the gossip as well, but it stuck with her. Ella was different. They knew it, and she was teased unmercifully. She tried to pretend that it didn't bother her, but I knew it did. I watched it change her. Ella liked to say she disliked everyone equally. Her senseless hatred was oblivious to race, gender, or sexual preference. She didn't talk about it very often, but it consumed her. The final blow that tore their friendship apart happened when we returned from Christmas break. Jennifer had moved into a room with one of her friends from soccer, and Ella was left alone. She only spoke about it once. One of the girls in the play had brought a bottle of wine with her to rehearsal, but she was afraid she would get caught. She gave it to me to hide. I brought it back to my room and went down the hall to get Ella. It was a great night. We giggled drunkenly and gossiped. She told me about her fight with Jennifer. She said I was the only friend she had. I made a joke and changed the subject. It made me uncomfortable to have anyone rely on me entirely. I didn't want that kind of responsibility. I had almost forgotten that night. All that remained was the memory of the terrible hangover I had the next morning. Everything came flooding back as I looked at Jennifer sitting beside me. She smiled her bright, friendly smile and laughed. My partner's out too. Want to work together? Um, sure. Why not? Great. The bell rang and she swung around swiftly to face the front of the room. Her hands were placed on top of the lab table, and she did not fuss with a pen or doodling on her notebook. She was the student from the glossy ads that the school sent out every year. She was attentive and ready to learn. I shook my head. It took Jennifer a little while to get to the point. She was trying to tell me something. I could figure out that much. But the rest was a mystery until about halfway through our lab period. She leaned over and handed me a folded up piece of paper. It was bright green, and I grabbed it eagerly. At least it wasn't blue. Jennifer's smile had faded a little. She looked angry, which was something new for Miss Perky. She leaned over so her lips were next to my ear. She waited until Mr. Perry's back was turned, and then she spoke. I know it's you. I was Ella's friend for a long time, you know. I cared about her. You think you know the entire story, but you've only heard one side. Please, let me tell you mine. I nodded, and she settled back in her seat with a relieved smile. I could accept the blame. She wouldn't believe that it was Ella anyway. Or maybe she would. But I wanted to hear her story. I didn't open the letter until after classes were over. It was folded into a perfect square, and the handwriting was becoming as familiar as my own. How do we balance time? What makes it fall apart? An innocent victim to your game. I've taken a beating for your heart. Friends will fall. Soon you will see it all. And I do not need to ask you, for I already know that you remember Ella. This was an interesting piece to the puzzle. The rhyming was forced, but it didn't seem threatening. I sat back in my chair. I had gone to the library thinking it would be deserted at this time of day, but I was wrong. I had barely unfolded the letter and read its contents when I felt someone standing behind me. Marcus slipped his arms around me and kissed my neck. I laughed as I struggled out of his grip. The librarian made a disapproving noise and glared at me, but she went back to her desk and didn't say another word. Marcus laughed and slid into the chair next to mine. What are you doing in here? Hiding from another angry mob? No, I said and laughed. His smile made everything seem funny and far away. It could diffuse the hatred in Brando's face, or the sickly expression that came over Byron whenever he saw me. I squeezed his hand with a grateful smile, and he squeezed my hand in return and kissed me. The kiss took me by surprise, but I managed to respond. It was everything I had thought it would be. He was an experienced kisser. There was no awkward clashing of teeth or accidental lip biting. I hadn't had a lot of luck kissing guys in the past. But kissing Marcus was like being in a movie. 
I felt myself falling completely under his spell. He pulled away and smiled at me. He placed his arm along the back of my chair. So, what are you doing? Homework? Sort of. Don't you have hockey practice this afternoon? Yeah, but I wanted to check on you first. I hardly ever see you now that you're in solitary. Headmaster Quincy thinks it's better this way. I don't like it. I worry about you, Sophie. Who's going to protect you if something happens? Nothing has happened since they moved me. I'm fine, Marcus. You don't need to worry. He gave me another quick kiss. Well, I'm going to worry anyway. I have to go. Will I see you at dinner? Definitely. I watched him walk away. He turned back when he got to the door and waved before walking out into the falling snow. I turned back to the letter, but it was hard to concentrate. Even with a mystery laid out before me, I could not stop thinking about Marcus. I spent an hour staring off into space and reliving every moment of that kiss. I stayed in the library until the bells rang for dinner. I couldn't find the connection between Ella and the letters. I wanted to be sure that she was the one behind it. I wished for a note that would explain it all. I wished Ella would show up on campus and share her plan. I needed proof. Another thought was beginning to work its way into my mind. Byron's strange behavior and his blatant avoidance of me was beginning to seem suspicious. I saw him talking to Brando outside the dining hall. I had never seen them speak before, and it increased my suspicions. They looked guilty and separated when they saw me. Byron quickly disappeared into the dining hall. But Brando came toward me, with his hands balled up at his sides. He stepped in front of me and would not let me pass. Leave me alone, Brando. He laughed and looked around. Me. That's funny, Sophie. Hilarious. I want you to leave me alone. How about that? If you won't, then do me in and be done with it. Stop messing with my head. I haven't done anything to you. Right, of course not. You're too smart to leave any clues. I may not be able to prove it yet, but I know it's you. Have you received another letter? He laughed again. His fists beat absently on his thighs. Yeah, I got your letters. You're wasting your time, you know. You can't scare me. I won't be intimidated. You're already scared. Shut up. He pushed past me and started to walk away, but I grabbed his coat. Brando, wait. Bring me the other letters. Maybe I can help you. I know you don't believe it, but I'm not responsible for this. You're not the only one who's receiving letters. If we work together, maybe we can figure out who is actually behind this. Why would I want to work with you? Because you want this to end as much as I do. He hesitated. The anger faded from his face and only sadness remained. I felt bad for him. Everyone knew that his father had abandoned his mother when he was little, and his stepdad hated him. They fought constantly, and their fights were the reason he was sent to Cullen Academy. Mr. Franklin had taken him under his wing and taught him how to deal with his anger. He helped him get a place on the varsity hockey team, and to Brando he had become the model of what a man should be. I could think of much better role models, but I still felt sorry for Brando. Once again, his father figure had abandoned him, and I didn't blame him for struggling so much in the aftermath of such a catastrophic letdown. I reached out and took his hand. It'll be okay, Brando. We have to trust each other. Maybe together we can solve this mystery. He squeezed my hand and sighed. His eyes were wet. He considered it for a moment, then pulled his hand away and shook his head. I can't. His eyes grew wide. Marcus was approaching, and he looked angry. Brando started to walk away. I'm staying in the Levine dorm if you change your mind. I really think we could help each other, Brando. You have no idea what's going on, do you, Sophie? With that, he walked away. I saw Marcus say something to him as they passed each other, but Brando didn't respond and just kept walking. Marcus stormed up to me and pushed me down onto a nearby bench. What was that? What is wrong with you? I saw you, Sophie. You were holding his hand. He's really upset. Mr. Franklin was like a father to him. He tried to kill you in front of the entire student body. Have you forgotten about that? No, but... No, Sophie. No buts. I will do everything I can to protect you, but you have to be smarter than this. Don't let that guy near you again. Do you understand? I nodded. 
I hadn't forgotten how it felt when my face hit the ice and I heard my bones crack. Still, something didn't make sense. Brando wasn't a monster. I knew that. We'd been at CA together for three years and had lots of classes together. We might not have been close friends, but I knew he was a genuinely good guy. And abandonment could make people do crazy things. Marcus was still seething as we walked into the dining hall and grabbed our trays. The general clamor of students talking and laughing made me feel more at ease. Life at CA was returning to some kind of normal, and I could still hope that it would all pass. Marcus and I sat alone, but he didn't talk to me and focused on the mountain of food on his plate. I looked around the dining hall. Byron and a few of his computer lab friends were seated at a table in the far corner of the room. The other students were mainly separated by sports teams, and we were getting a few odd looks from the other hockey players and their girlfriends. It was unheard of for a member of the team to not sit at the long table that ran along the side of the room under the windows. Marcus was breaking protocol. He stopped eating. His expression was blank, as if his mind was somewhere far, far away. He suddenly noticed me and took my hand. He smiled absently, but he was still lost in thought, though he was trying to pretend that he was there. I'm sorry I lost my temper out there. It's okay. I really care about you, Sophie. I don't want anything bad to happen to you. I'll be okay, Marcus. Stop worrying so much. I wasn't entirely sure that I was right, but I didn't want him to do anything crazy. I kept hoping that everyone would forget about me. If he lost control and beat up Brando, everyone would focus on me again, and I was tired of the attention. Something about Marcus was different. He was tense and edgy. He kept looking around the dining hall as if waiting for someone to appear. He wasn't paying attention to me now, so I watched Byron and his friends. They stared at their food and didn't speak most of the time. Once in a while, one of them would say something that made the others laugh, and a discussion would ensue. Byron looked at me only once. We made eye contact, and he did not look away. His expression was peculiar, and I could not tell what he was thinking. I had to talk to him. I had to know what he knew, or if he had had contact with Ella. Maybe he knew why she was doing this. Marcus stood up suddenly. He looked tired and irritated, and he collected his empty plate slowly. I have practice tonight. See you tomorrow morning? I hope so. Be careful, Sophie. I don't want anything to happen to you. I watched him walk away and wished, for the hundredth time, that things were simpler. I sighed and looked back over at Byron's table. They were all laughing at something, and Byron glanced over again. He said something to his friends and stood up. They all turned to look at me with annoyance. A few of them looked frightened. He flopped down next to me and tossed his hair out of his eyes. It immediately fell back into place, but he didn't brush it away. What do you want to know, Sophie? About what? He sighed and gave me an irritated look. Ella. What do you want to know about Ella? What do you mean? She was my friend. Have you heard from her lately? Since she left school. No. We lost touch. Why? Byron looked around. Suddenly, he turned pale and stood up quickly. I have to go. Where are they hiding you? Levine. He nodded quickly. I'll come tonight. He moved away quickly, and I looked around the room. The bell rang for evening study hours, and everyone got up and hurried toward the doors. Byron was swallowed up by the group and disappeared. I walked slowly back to my dorm. Byron's voice when he asked about Ella was harsh and strained. He was afraid, and I wondered what new piece of the puzzle his visit would bring. The evening passed slowly. Every sound was Brando or Byron waiting outside my window. I couldn't concentrate on my homework. I could only think about Ella and the strange mystery that surrounded her. I had so many pieces to this strange puzzle, but I couldn't make them fit. An idea was forming in the back of my mind, but it was too gruesome and sinister to think about. I pushed it away and thought about Marcus instead. He was incredible. Nothing else mattered when he was around, and I liked the way he made me feel safe. I was worried that I had made a mistake telling Byron and Brando where I was staying. I don't know why I didn't tell Marcus. I was used to being alone, and now he was with me during every free moment. I loved being around him, but I did feel the need to have some privacy. He was showing his temper more often, and it worried me. I couldn't imagine what he would do if he knew that I had told them. 
it wouldn't be good. I finally finished my homework and left the room. Levine had a nice plush common room, and I was allowed to use it in the evenings if I finished my homework. The light was off when I entered. I flipped the switch and screamed. The room was covered in blood. Smears of red ran across the walls and painted over a large, ornate mirror were the words, Do you remember Ella? I dropped to my knees and buried my face in my hands. Mrs. Miller screamed when she saw me, and I had trouble convincing her that I was unhurt. She had been assigned the role of my dorm mother, and I had a feeling that she missed her comfortable apartment and dorm full of happy girls. When she was finally convinced that I was not bleeding all over the beautiful carpets, she called the headmaster. Her voice was shrill as she stood in the hallway, begging Headmaster Quincy to come over immediately. When he got there, Mrs. Miller had sent me down to the first floor apartment, where she was living for the time being. I heard their voices on the floor above, but could not make out the words. Headmaster Quincy came into the apartment with a grim look on his face. He was pale, and his hands shook as he drank the cup of coffee Mrs. Miller poured for him. We sat in silence and sipped the hot black liquid. I had tried coffee before, but hated the bitter taste. I didn't care about the taste now. I just needed something to keep my mind off the nightmare that my life had become. Joe Blood arrived next, and the headmaster led him upstairs. Mrs. Miller put on a movie for me and hurried to join them. Their voices murmured overhead. I knew the tone. I sat in front of the large, flat screen and watched Adam Sandler doing something stupid. I wondered what I should do. Should I tell? How much do they need to know? It should have been an easy decision. They were adults, and it was their job to protect the students. Still, something made me hold back. When they came downstairs, they sat in front of me and asked a lot of questions. It was obvious that they thought I'd done it. I had no alibi, and Mrs. Miller had found me sitting in the middle of the mess. I had no way to defend myself, and I knew before they had finished questioning me that my days at Cullen Academy were numbered. Headmaster Quincy and Joe Blood left around midnight. I was certain by that time that I would be sent back to Whitetail to attend the local public school with all the people I had tried to escape. I went to my room and laid down. Levine was far away from the main campus. There were fewer street lamps, and the darkness of the room was unsettling. I was just beginning to doze off when I heard tapping on the window. My heart jumped into my throat, and I broke out in a cold sweat. I could not make my body move for a long time. The tapping would pause for a little while, and then continue. It never stopped. I finally managed to move off the bed and went to the window. A large branch swung up, and I muffled the scream and waited for the glass to fly but the branch landed softly and tapped the glass. Marcus was standing in the small yard behind the dorm. He was holding the other end of the branch. He waved when he saw me. As I opened the window, he ran and grabbed onto the roof of the outdoor patio. He pulled himself up and made his way carefully across the metal while trying to make as little noise as possible. I opened the window and we were face to face. He kissed me without a word and pulled me out of the window. We jumped down and ran across the snowy yard to the main road that ran through the campus. We ran for a while in silence. Marcus was in amazing shape, but I had never been an athletic girl. I was on the dance team in the winter, but I didn't do much else. I was panting after just a few minutes. The icy air burned my lungs, and I had to stop. Marcus rubbed my back and slipped his warm winter jacket over my shoulders. He took my hand, and we walked on in silence. The night was beautiful. A full moon danced over the fresh snow. The hills glowed a blinding blue-white in the moonlight. The snow on the ground flew up and shone in the air around our feet as we stepped. Marcus, where are we going? His smile grew wide, but he shook his head. It's a surprise. I had a terrible night. I am not in the mood for surprises. Just trust me, Sophie. You're going to love it. He gave my hand a squeeze and we plunged on through the light snowfall and bright moonlight. I was wearing my slippers and my feet were getting cold. When I mentioned it, Marcus grabbed me and swung me up off the ground. He carried me up the long dirt road that led to the nature trails. And he carried me up the long dirt road that led to the nature trails. When he turned off onto the familiar trail, my heart began to pound. My body tensed and Marcus almost dropped me when I shifted my weight. Whoa, what's up, Sophie? I want to know where we're going. The farmhouse, of course. I am not going to the farmhouse tonight. I'm freezing and exhausted and I want to go back. But you're going to love this. 
Not tonight, Marcus. I want to go back to my room. I need to get some sleep. They're deciding tomorrow morning if I have to go home. No, Sophie. Tomorrow doesn't matter. Tonight is everything. Please trust me. How do I know I can? He looked hurt and gently put me back on my feet. Go, if you don't trust me. I just hope you know that I will never do anything to hurt you. I want to protect you, Sophie. How did you find me tonight, Marcus? It wasn't hard to figure out where they were housing you. There aren't that many empty dorms. I didn't know what to say. His wild look was terrifying, and yet when he pledged his love for me, and yet when he pledged his love for me and vowed again to protect me, I couldn't help feeling that he was perfect and that I was lucky he cared about me. He took my hands and smiled. You can trust me, Sophie. You are more to me than you could ever know. I am your protector for life. Even if you decide not to love me, I will always love you. He kissed me, and I melted against him. I didn't notice my cold feet or the feeling of dread in my heart. The only thing I could think about was his body. His hands were strong, his lips soft, and I could feel his power as I pressed up against him. He pulled away too soon and led me up the path. There was more than one set of footprints in the snow. Marcus moved forward eagerly. He pulled at my arm, but I drew back and slowed as we neared the imposing building. The house looked alive in the bright moonlight. I followed Marcus slowly into the dark, gaping mouth of the front door. He led me into the kitchen, where a beautiful candlelit table was waiting. A bouquet of roses and a box of chocolates waited in the soft glow of the candlelight. He pulled out one of the chairs, and I sat down. He placed a box in front of me. It was small and round. Inside was a beautiful ring. It was carved out of a green stone and had intricate flowers and symbols adorning it. Marcus took the ring and placed it on my finger. I love you, Sophie. I want you to love me. I want you to trust me. I just want to be with you. His eyes were wet and I kissed him. We spent the rest of the night out there. Marcus brought a pile of warm blankets and we curled up on the porch under the stars. I couldn't stand to be inside that house. Everything was larger than life and alive in the bright white moonlight. The darkness was pocked with small clusters of stars covering the sky. When dawn came, we walked back down to the dorm and Marcus helped me climb back into my window. He blew me a kiss and hurried back to his own dorm. I took a long, hot shower and took my time getting dressed. I met Marcus outside the dining hall, and he kissed me again. He was incredibly handsome, even with the big, dark circles under his eyes. I spent the morning in a blissful daze. I floated through my classes without noticing anyone around me. By lunchtime, the story of the dorm's destruction and the same cryptic message had circled the campus. It was all anyone was talking about, and I was forced out of my daydream. Marcus had a meeting with his coaches during lunch, so I sat with a couple girls I knew from drama. They gossiped incessantly through lunch, and it was impossible to tune them out. They rattled on about the dorm and how it had looked. I pressed my lips together to keep from correcting their outlandish stories. It was not known that I was staying there, and I wanted to keep it a secret as long as possible. Melissa leaned over the table with a gleam in her eye. Her gossip was going to be juicy, and we all grew more attentive. Even my interest was piqued by her excited expression. I heard that he was behind it all. They caught him leaving the school and expelled him right then and there. They sent him home in the middle of the night, just like that. They really can't stand it if a student embarrasses the school. The girls shook their heads wisely, as if they had any idea of what was truly going on. I gripped the table and looked at them impatiently. Who was sent home? Melissa smiled at me. She was proud to be the one with all the details. Byron. He was behind it all. Never got over Ella and finally just went crazy. They say she never even called him after she went home. Byron was sent home? The girls stared at me. Where have you been? That's been the big news on campus all morning. Jenna laughed and elbowed Melissa. Oh, I think Sophie's got better people to think about than boring old Byron. They giggled and waited for me to tell everything, but I didn't. I couldn't even try to indulge them. Byron was gone. I couldn't believe it. He was going to tell me. I was finally going to find out what was actually going on. I wondered momentarily if he really was behind it all. 
He knew where I was staying and would have had plenty of time to destroy the place while I worked on my homework in my room. The girls grew tired of my silence and left. I barely noticed. As I sat staring at my salad, Mrs. Miller sat down across from me. She looked exhausted, but she smiled wearily at me. Sophie, I'm sorry about last night. I should have been more watchful. If I'd only paid attention, this might not have happened. It's not your fault, Mrs. Miller. She sighed deeply. We know you didn't do it. Byron left a letter of confession. A letter? She nodded and rubbed her tired eyes. What color was the paper? She looked surprised. Yellow. Why? No reason. The bell rang and we went our separate ways. Byron was gone, and he'd confessed to everything. I couldn't believe it. It was possible, of course. He could have come to Levine to confess and lost his nerve. Or maybe he wanted to go out with a bang. It all seemed so absurd. I wanted to see that letter. I knew that if I saw it, I would be able to tell if it was like the pile of letters accumulating in my folder. But what then? I wouldn't know what it proved. If the mystery was truly over, the end was very anticlimactic and confusing. It was all over, but nothing was finished. And that is the end of chapter four of Do You Remember Ella? I hope you're enjoying the story, book lovers. I will be back very soon, sooner than this time, I promise, with a new chapter. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, keep reading.